Oh dear, that's not a very good move. Decades ago, when I was in school, I would play this subtraction game with my friend. It starts with a pile of 20 or more tokens. We took turns removing one, two or three tokens from the pile. Whoever was forced to take the last token loses. After playing this game and losing a few times, my friend eventually figured out the key strategy of reducing the pile to certain values that would guarantee a win. Any number that had a remainder of 1 when divided by 4. Back then, I was also learning to program in BASIC on my dad's 8-bit microcomputer. I had programmed the computer to play this game with this strategy hard-coded into the implementation. But today, I'm now wondering, could the computer have discovered the winning strategy by itself, knowing nothing but the rules of the game, much like my friend did? The subtraction game can be modeled as a finite number of game states, each state representing how many tokens are currently in the pile. We can simulate several games by choosing moves, largely at random, until one player loses. By noting the states that led to one player losing and the other winning, we can use this information to estimate the relative value of each game state. The experience gained from the outcome of every game is incorporated into this value function by applying a learning rule that updates the values that this function returns for each game state. Alpha is a scalar between 0 and 1 that linearly interpolates the previous value and the new reward value. This reward is based on the value of the state reached on the next move that is played. It is multiplied by a negative number in order to reward moves that place your opponent in a bad position. Gamma is a scaling factor less than 1 to act as a discounting term. There will be more than one way to leave your opponent in the exact same bad position, so the entire reward should not be awarded to this one game state. The value function is initiated to zero or small random values with one exception. V0, for the state where one player has lost the game, is fixed to a large negative value. This incentivizes the computer to avoid this game state at all cost. Initially, the simulated games start with both players choosing moves at random, but gradually we adjust both players to start adopting a more greedy strategy of picking the move that would maximize the value of the destination game state. And from out of the noise, the same familiar strategy emerges that my friend had discovered back in school. Granted, he did so after far fewer games than the computer took here. So now you might be wondering, this learning rule, how general is it? Can it be applied to other games? The game of Chomp is a two-player game that starts with a rectangular bar of chocolate. A move consists of choosing a block to eat, eating all blocks to the right of it, all blocks below it, and all blocks to the right and below. Players take turns eating these rectangular bites out of the bar. The player that eats the last block loses. Because the top left block is always among the last blocks to be eaten, it is sometimes marked as being poisoned. To apply the same learning rule to this game, we need to find some way to represent the value of each game board configuration. This was trivial for the subtraction game because the game state was just a single non-negative integer. We just used an array for v. What can we use for the chomp game? We could represent each board as a binary number, with 1 or 0 representing the presence or absence of a block respectively. By using the binary bits to select a path through a binary tree, the game state value can then be stored at the leaf nodes. However, this data structure incurs significant memory overheads. Data structures provided natively by programming languages, such as Python, carry similar overheads of needing to store key value pairs. Storage is required for the game states as well, not just for their value. Efficient use of memory is an issue because I want to be able to run this on microcontrollers with limited memory. And even if you have gigabytes of memory at your disposal, it is still worth making an effort to store game state values efficiently. Programs run faster if the problem representation can fit into faster cache memory. 
or if virtual memory can be avoided when tackling very large numbers of possible game states. Consider the game board after a number of valid chomp moves. Each can be uniquely described by a sequence of down-facing and right-facing edges of the board. If we use 1 for the horizontal edges and 0 for the vertical edges, each game configuration can be encoded as a binary number. For the 7 by 5 case, this binary encoding will always have 12 bits, 7 of which are set to 1. Given the width and height of the chomp board, we can thus count every possible game configuration by using the combinations formula for n choose k. So this will give us the size of our game state value array. But how do we index this array? We need to implement a function that converts binary encodings into an array index such that there are no collisions and no gaps left unused. If the indexing of the value array starts from 0, then the array index will be equal to the number of entries required to store all the binary encodings that precede the one we are trying to access. For the case of n choose 1, this is trivial. The array index is just the position of the bit that is set to 1. Now consider the n choose 2 case. We can partition the full indexing range according to the position of the most significant bit that is set to 1. The sizes of each partition is straightforward to calculate. This also happens to be given by the n choose k combinations formula, where k equals 1. Does this generalize? Here is the n choose 3 case. The partition sizes are given by n choose 2. This partitioning trick can be applied not just to the position of the most significant one bit, it can be applied to each subsequent bit set to 1, so as to recursively subdivide the array indexing range until we are accessing individual game states in our value array. Working out the array index of a given binary encoding is thus a matter of summing the sizes of all preceding partitions at different levels of this hierarchy. From this, we can derive a neat algorithm for converting any n choose k binary encoding. Here is an example for 8 choose 3. Scanning the bits from least significant to most significant, the first one bit is found in position 2. Add the number of combinations 0 choose 0 to 1 choose 0. The second one bit is found in position 4. Add up the combinations 1 choose 1 to 3 choose 1. The third one bit is found in position 7, so add up the combinations 2 choose 2 to 6 choose 2. Admittedly, this is still a bit confusing. The pattern becomes clearer when you look where these combination sums appear on Pascal's triangle. For the first one bit, add up the first diagonal column, stopping just short of the second row. For the second one bit, add up the second diagonal column, stopping just short of the fourth row. And for the third one bit, add up the third diagonal column, stopping just short of the seventh row. We can also exploit a neat property of Pascal's triangle. Each of these diagonal column sums can be simplified to a simple term found on the next row. You can prove this identity for yourself using induction. The induction step is simply the summing rule used to construct Pascal's triangle. Do you see the base case? This simplification yields a very tidy formula for deriving the array index of n choose k binary encodings. This can be encoded very efficiently on a microcontroller and used to in index an array directly. There is no need for hash tables, Python dictionaries, or binary trees. Note that for some binary encodings, the formula can end up evaluating terms outside of the classic Pascal's triangle. This is easily resolved by extending an extra column of zeros beyond the rightmost numbers. So a computer can use the same learning rule and a simple array of values to discover a strategy for playing the chomp game. I've programmed an ESP32 microcontroller to simulate 2000 games. This development board is the tiny Pico from the unexpected maker.
It is driving a TFT LCD RGB display to show its progress. Let me power it up. It starts selecting moves pretty much randomly. As it starts to discover this, that certain board configurations are of greater value than others, you should see this reflected in the differing colors of the blocks. Reddish hues indicate higher value board positions. You should try to move to these configurations in order to force your opponent to eat the last block. Interestingly, those basic computer games books that I used to teach myself to code contained a form of the subtraction game. It went by the name NIM or 23 matches, as well as the chomp game. However, only the former allowed the user to play against the computer. But as you can see here, it was within the capabilities of 8-bit and 16-bit machines of that era to implement a computer opponent that human users could play against.